So this is the shockwave technology. Um, initially it was called uh, lithoplasty, uh, but uh, intravascular lithotripsy is the, is the abbreviation that's been adopted. Uh, there are a number of you in the room who have already started doing this, um, whether you're coronary operators, TAVI operators, peripheral, uh, peripheral vascular disease operators, but the experience is really accumulating. Um, over 10,000 cases now done worldwide, more than 1,000 operators in 30 countries, um, and more than 50 publications. James Spratt in the front row there being what, you know, one of the real drivers in the coronary space. It's a system which is intuitive to use. There's no learning curve at all. Uh, the first case in Bahrain done last night. Simple setup. A box which is a, essentially a capacitor which you charge. Um, it takes about 20 minutes to charge up. It's not plugged into the mains when you're, it's connected to the patient. You have, a, you have the um, uh, connector cable. And then the disposable is the balloon. And within the balloon are the, the um, shockwave emitters. So within the coronary circulation, there are, there are two emitters. And really what it's doing is uh, enabling you to deliver lithotripsy, so sonic pressure waves, um, which is a technology that's been in widespread use in, for, for kidney stones. And, it's, and really the beauty of this is it's just a simple application of an, an old idea in, in a new presentation format. So miniaturized lithotripsy emitters within a balloon, why can't you deliver them to a coronary artery or to a peripheral, a peripheral vessel? So this is the setup, I'll just play this video. Is there sound that you can? I think there is some sound. It's on, it's on the bottom right of your video. If you can pop up the mouse over it, can come up. Yeah. Bottom right. <coughs> yes. That's a compact rechargeable generator. Okay. That's Probably better than it is. No, maybe not. <laughs> and intuitive. So this is the system. Put the lithotripsy emitters within within the device. Uh, so this would be an example of a peripheral catheter which has more, more with tripsy emitters and um, in the coronary, uh, currently it's only two. Um, and the idea is it's, it's a you know, monorail system delivered to the lesion very simply and inflated at low pressure. So once the balloon is inflated, very often we will have done intravascular imaging beforehand, but you'll have the constrictions from the calcium. You all know those types of case, the dog-boned balloon. You know, you go in with a very high pressure balloon. Perhaps previously you would have gone in then with a rotational atherectomy. Uh, but this really provides a very sort of simple, straightforward system, as simple as pressing the button. Can I interrupt you? Yeah. And the biggest challenge when you have calcium bite is actually getting anything to cross. So yeah. The crossing profile. So the crossing profile is it's larger than a non-compliant balloon, but more deliverable than a angioscope, for example. So in quite a lot of the early experience, that if there was any crossing difficulty, which I think happens in about one in ten, one in twenty cases, um, then use a guideliner or do pre-dilatation with a 1.5 balloon, which is what we did yesterday. Um, and then we um, will use rotational atherectomy in a proportion of cases. <coughs> so this is the appearance once the emitter is uh, activated. There's a steam cavitation bubble, and it's as that bubble collapses that the shock waves then uh, emanate out in a circumferential spherical pattern. Um, these acoustic pressure waves, there is an equivalent pressure of between 50 and 80 atmospheres. So if you're looking at that in comparison to you know, an OPN balloon, 30 to 40 atmospheres, this is a very momentary, very high pressure uh, wave. It, it will disrupt the 
hard tissue, the calcium, but the soft tissue is left untouched. So that's just what we see here. These are, this is a sort of mock-up with the equivalent of these sort of calcific rings. And so, so these are the sort of gypsum rings that they've made for these experiments. Press the button and you know, now the artery, your artery doesn't fall apart like this, of course, it's contained with, within, uh, within your um, the soft, soft tissues. But, and you can, you can hold on to the balloon. And I mean, we were actually demonstrating this last night, so you can see the, the sparks there. You can hold on to it, and you can just feel a little tap on your finger. Yes? So there's no, because it's contained within the soft tissue, it's held within the, the, the intimal medial layer. Sure, but there, aren't, there isn't any particulate debris, so there isn't then the potential for, for slow flow. Uh, well, we'll, sh we'll show you. So I think, um, I mean, it, it, it's, it's useful when there's circumferential calcium and thick calcium. And in fact, that's one of the ways in which we've been, a lot of the early cases have been done with intravascular imaging, in particular with OCT, where we can make a judgment about the calcium angle. And you can see what happens with the, the fracture of the calcium. So these are fractures through the calcium. So here another very tight lesion, a peripheral artery. And you can see, say, within an aortic valve leaflet, that there is fragmentation of blocks of calcium into much smaller uh, blocks, which are much more conformable. So there's really, therefore, a broad range of applications. It's, it's less effective in concentric calcium. It's more effective in con concentric calcium because of the lack of uh, the, the reflection you get within, there's loss of energy when you get reflection of the pressure waves. When there's circumferential uh, calcium, then you will get circumferential cracks. So very useful in peripheral arterial disease. The program in the US and in Germany has really taken off as they've now got approval. Um, obviously, applications uh, in, in any vascular territory. And there are some new devices that are coming, which, which are in development at the moment for the treatment of uh, aortas as well as aortic valves. So the shockwave coronary system has two emitters. This is the pathway of investigation so, so far. These have all been effectively safe, safety and efficacy studies. The Disrupt CAD1 study uh, was done predominantly in Europe. Um, which is now reported. CAD2 has just been reported um, and published, just reported at TCT. CAD3, which is ongoing uh, now, uh, which I'm the PI for with Dean Kariakis, is about two-thirds of the way through recruiting. Um, and there, there are going to be, there's going to be a Japanese study, and there was a whole raft of investigator-initiated projects uh, in, in the pipeline. So it's, very, it's a very active program. And this was the CAD1 study design. There were 31 patients included in an OCT sub-study, uh, which I think was a really useful way uh, to learn about uh, the mechanism of action. And really the safety profile I mean, it speaks for itself. There were no dissections, no perforations, no abrupt closure, no slow flow, no, no reflow. Very satisfactory early 30 day, so 30 day MACE and six month MACE. Um, but remember, this is obviously uh, more straightforward selected lesions. That, that was uh, published in circulation. Uh, this is the sub study, so led by Ziad Ali from CRF. Um, so, this, this has really been instrumental in showing the mechanism of action. And really, what you see and it may be that we'll get a chance to do that in a case later today. Uh, we're looking at the acute gains that you get with, with lithotripsy. Remember, inflated at four atmospheres, lithotripsy uh, energy delivered, and then you almost, uh, in some cases, get a stent-like result. So, 
in the terms of the real world experience, um, this is a collection of cases that's been done at King's. Uh, it's been used by the majority of the interventionists there. Um, not always done, perhaps in the conventional way, but not always with intravascular imaging. Uh, but certainly it's got wide, widespread application, whether it's you've just got dense calcification in, within your coronary on angiography, whether you've got a balloon undilatable lesion, an undeployed stent, or you've actually confirmed concentric calcification on OCT. So there's just, uh, over, just over 100 procedures here. Um, just under 10% uh, had a previously undilatable lesion, and by that we would mean we've used high pressure balloons, uh, but not obviously not with uh, rotational atherectomy. OCT used in about half of the cases, and procedural success, 91% um, with 100% facilitation of stent delivery. And we didn't have any episodes, uh, no cases of device-related coronary perforation. Uh, so it's safe, um, and I think it's a, a much more straightforward uh, mode of calcium modification. So these are the various uh, scenarios, undilatable lesions, calcification that you see on intravascular imaging, bifurcation lesions, and I think this is going to be an important application, especially in left main stem disease, failure of rotational atherectomy, or facilitation of rotational atherectomy, and I think there are going to be applications in uh, CTA, PCI. So here's an undilatable lesion. Um, this, this is a, a lesion that had been uh, attempted with very, including with the ultra high pressure balloon, so over 40 atmospheres, undilatable. So and here's another example, um, very heavy calcium burden noted on OCT. Um, so this was again a, a, something that was perhaps not evident on the coronary angiogram, but certainly evident on intravascular imaging. Um, and in my experience now, I'm, I'm using um, intravascular imaging for, for well over 80% of the cases. So you've got this appearance of a dog bone blue. Okay, so here we are. Back to that lesion. Tight concentric calcification. Very constrained bloom. This is the type of undilatable lesion. Oh, I do apologise, it's not playing. See this place. So this is what we, we see with the uh, after the intravascular lithotripsy. So this is an OCT view, and what we're seeing are, are these these really significant cracks along the wall. In fact, it's like the sort of tectonic plates. Of these are sort of sheets of calcium which have moved apart, and you can see really this very nice effect of the intravascular lith lithotripsy with a with a crack through this circumferential calcium. Okay. So how many seconds should you wait? So pressing the button, you will activate the emitters, and so 10 seconds, so one pulse per second, and each balloon. So this is a, a, a case where we were using rotational atherectomy. So undilatable balloon, rotational atherectomy, You've got persistent balloon under expansion even after rotor, which we do see on occasions. Um, we, had, we had actually used two, uh, we've upsized from a 1.25 up to 1.75. Deliver, delivery here of the IVL pulses, and you can see that then that balloon is expanding, and then you get good expansion within the stented segment. So rotablation in this situation may have made superficial cuts within the calcium. So that may be sufficient to allow for a non-compliant balloon uh, to, to expand. Intravascular lithotripsy, on the other hand, will make cracks all the way through in a circumferential fashion. Uh, and almost in all of the cases where that occurs is that the balloon will expand. So a constricted balloon of four atmospheres will then slowly inflate before your eyes uh, during the energy delivery. So that again? 
So within the coronary circulation, it's a 12 millimeter balloon, and then peripherally, there are 40 millimeter balloons. But this is the type of scenario with an unexpanded stents. And what we're able to do is then get stents fully expanded, which would be constricted at the time of implantation. Perhaps there hasn't been adequate uh, delivery of, of, so there hasn't been adequate vessel preparation. Um, and I think, I think this is going to be a, a fairly widespread application. Of course, uh, Shockwave themselves don't want to advocate this as a primary use of it, but I think that's in, in reality, I think it's going to be used in, in this scenario uh, quite commonly. This situation used it after the deployment of the stent? We've used it after the deployment of the stent. Um, and there is an argument that it will, it will not, um, it, it may disrupt the stent surface if it's a freshly implanted stent. I think that's a theoretical consideration, which I think is probably a, of a lesser importance than leaving a stent completely undilated. I think certainly when you come back after three, six months and the, the stent has been relined, um, then the, uh, I think the effects on the stent will be, will be ne negligible. But essentially, I mean, intravascular lithotripsy now, you can all see that it's a, an intuitive device to use. Um, I think that where it's being introduced, uh, it, I think it's, it's rapidly gaining traction. So people are using it and interposing it in their treatment of calcium. So from between non-compliant blooms, um, and rotational atherectomy. And certainly <coughs> people who don't do rotational atherectomy, then it's, it's actually, I think, a, a, a very useful way to be able to deal with calcium modification. It doesn't matter how deep is the calcification, like so between the superficial and deep calcification and the outcome. And do you do, you do IVUS before you do uh, the... Uh, well, we, we've been doing IVUS and OCT. Um, and certainly I think the treatment algorithms, and James has been a sort of key part of this, uh, is emphasizing the importance of intravascular imaging to guide lesion preparation. And that's a general principle that I think is being applied not just to calcified disease, but to PCI more generally. But, uh, and we're seeing that with the introduction of uh, you know, more precise uh, OCT algorithms, there's the Illumium 4 study going on worldwide now, looking at the introduction of OCT in more complex disease. And I think we're, we're, we're moving into a new era now of um, lesion preparation and precision stenting. And I think this is just going to be one example of that where intravascular, intravascular imaging is used. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll we're moving into an era, I think, of full PCI optimization, physiological judgment, as well as image, image guidance. Okay. So we've, this is a case that was done um, by James and myself, um, where in that reverse cart situation, I'm not sure whether this is going to be widely applicable, but where there is a troubleshooting in very heavily calcified vessels, difficult reverse cart, it's a simple manoeuvre just to put a sub substitute your, your uh, compliant or semi-compliant balloon, fully compliant or non-compliant balloon for a shockwave balloon, and it may well help you facilitate that reverse cart procedure in a very heavily calcified vessel. So I think if you have access to this technology or thinking about getting it, I would, su I would suggest uh, doing it as soon as possible. I think it's extremely useful. It's very safe. It's definitely a feasible alternative uh, and perhaps a, a primary option uh, compared to other available technologies. And certainly in, it, it will be used, I think, in advance of rotational atherectomy in, in, a, in a, a large proportion of cases. Um, there's lots of clinical evidence uh, coming down the pipeline. The CAD3 study will report next year. Uh, the Japanese study uh, will be starting soon. Uh, and there are lots of uh, independent investigator-led initiatives which will also uh, uh, be
commenced in the, in the coming months. I think it needs to be uh, seen in the context of other calcium modification techniques, certainly where does it sit alongside rotational atherectomy. Um, my prediction is, is that it will be seen as a complementary technology, not, not uh, directly in competition. Um, so I think it's going to be a very useful part of the uh, calcium algorithm. Thank you. Thank you.